Hi there, welcome to Point Blank Music School here in London, where today we're joined by the man behind Hypercolor, one of my own personal favourite labels, and DJ Mag's Best of British, Best Label 2012. Um, Jamie's here for another industry special of Friday Forum Live. Uh, over the past year, Hypercolor, his label, has been one of the biggest labels in the house scene, with a slew of massive releases from uh, people like George Fitzgerald, Maxi Sound System, Huxley, and plenty of other big time producers. Um, and younger producers as well, like Bearskin. Jamie's also had a hand in several other labels, which we're going to speak about in a bit. Mm. And he's been running club nights, and he's a DJ himself. So, um, give a hand up. <laughs> um, just before we start this, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone out there that's watching that we're giving away one of three pairs of Pioneer HDJ500 headphones. Uh, it's your last chance today to enter the competition. All you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel, so um, make sure you do that. We've got three pairs to give away, so that's uh, a lot more ch chance, not more chance of winning than if we gave away one pair. <laughs> anyway, Jamie. Hello. Nice to have you here. How you doing, Manuel? Yeah, not bad. Good Big to see ups. you. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to start off with was uh, your backgrounds, because obviously before Hypercolor came into existence, you were a yeah. DJ yourself. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Um, how, how did everything kind of start for you? Where did you kind of you know get to grips with DJing? Um, <clears throat> how fast will I take this back? I mean, basically, I mean, I first, I guess, you know, first getting into music. Um, in my sort of early teens, uh, believe it or not, it was via my father, oh, yeah? who was a bit of a raver himself. And uh, yeah, kind of my mum and dad split up when I was quite young, and you know, that's probably one of the big reasons as to why, because he used to sort of tend to go out and spend a lot of weekends in the fields. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it sort, of, sort of just picking up on sort of flyers and, and eventually. Uh, tapes uh, from him which I, I would take to school and sort of share around. Um, that kind of developed into um, eventually putting on parties in my sort of early 20s. I used to put on a party uh, called Playground at the, uh, the Bullingdon Arms pub in Oxford. Very, right. very sort of small back room of a pub. Is that where you're from then, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. originally from Oxford. Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, and I mean, I yeah, I, I eventually sort of moved to Brighton, but that's kind of where I where I grew up. Um, so yeah, just putting on parties at the time, kind of not not really knowing much about music. I mean, sort of some of the early flyers and bookings, which I won't go into detail about, were kind of quite laughable at the time. But um, predominantly, it was house that I was booking, you know, yeah. and um, kind of that yeah, that that sort of. I mean, actually putting on parties, because I didn't, I didn't DJ at the time. Mm. So I was just putting on these parties and I guess sort of seeing how much fun the DJs were having and, uh, you know, putting on these parties and probably losing money on most of these parties at the time. So it was, uh, yeah, it just got to a point where I was like, right, I run these parties. I'm mm. in a, I think the mic's falling off. I run these parties and I'm in a really good position um, to just basically put myself on to DJ. Yeah, yeah. And um, so it was kind of a matter of just, you know, going out and, and doing it myself. And that party eventually moved up to London. Um, I don't know why, I just, I guess it was sort of, London seemed like a bigger, yeah. bigger place, the bright place lights. And, yeah, and uh, we were doing parties on, uh, I think it was Play Bar on Old Street. I don't know if you yeah, are yeah, old yeah. enough to remember that. But um, then eventually went to Free Free Free. And it was putting on the parties um, that kind of made me delve further into exploring music. I mean, we was quite fortunate that in Oxford, we probably had one of the best record stores in the country in Massive Records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember and hearing loads about that. Yeah, Massive. yeah. And I, I used to go in there and, um, I mean, you had Jay from Fear of Flying. I don't know if you know Fear of Flying, the label. Yeah. Jay Massive and Ben, who is BLM, both worked in the shop. And obviously have gone on to, to doing sort of, you know, well, putting out really interesting yeah, music. Yeah, yeah, kind of they're cool doing label. some really cool stuff. But used to go in there and you'd see like Sasha in there on a Saturday or Mick Warren or um, James Laval, mm. you know. And um, 
yeah, it was kind of, it really was the record emporium, you know, to, 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 to go to in the UK. So we were really blessed with, with kind of having access to um, amazing music. And for me, at the time, I perhaps, you know, was on my own journey of exploring and educating myself, but I was, you know, the music that was being played at those parties was like defected, early defected, right. early subliminal, you know, Eric Murillo. Um, of course, all the French filtered disco stuff, mm. the Daft Punk, which is kind of eventually where my ridiculous sort of DJ name came from. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was just about having a party at the time, basically. Um, but the party kind of led me to meeting people, you know, like eventually like Alex, who yeah, I now yeah. run Hypercolor with. Mm. Um, so it was just all about putting on a party and getting smashed, I guess, at the time, really, <laughs> to be quite blunt with it. Um, so, but, so at what point did it kind of start becoming more of a serious kind of vocation for you? Um, what do you mean, the label? Well, just... I just mean, the, part, the parties were never really serious. I mean, mm. it was never really something that I kind of thought that I could earn a living from. I mean, far from it. I mean, I actually used to... I used to just plunder all my wages into mm. sort of putting on these sort of big events where I might spend three or four grand on a lineup and a venue and much to my girlfriend at the time's total dismay, you know, it was like, <laughs> it, yeah. And I mean, as, as for the, yeah, the label, I mean, I mean, I've sort of been doing, or I've been throwing myself into music full time now for sort of the last, I guess like last two and a half, three years. Right. Um, right. I had one bash at it about five years ago thinking that you know, I was just going to throw everything into it and see how it went, and that kind of resulted in a relationship ending. So, right. So, it, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I think, yeah, the last sort of two and a half years, really. Um, I mean, Alex has kind of always had his DJ in, it, in production stuff, mm. um, whereas I've kind of steered a career for myself. Now, I mean, the labels are you know going great, and um, you know we're on this sort of massive. Uh, expansion of, of the labels because we've got quite a few and and we're quite consistent with pr production so that kind mm. of with that comes mm. quite an investment um, so what I actually do now in order to earn a living to, to, to run side to, to, to the labels is I'm I work as a freelance PR so yep. it's kind of what I do on a daily basis is um, shout about people's records mm. which is great you know yeah, yeah. Um, and that's going really well, you know. Um, I've set up, like I said, a PR company. Um, we're working with some really interesting labels, and I've really just capitalised for the back of the label's success mm. in, you know, kind of, um, yeah, I've utilised all these contacts that I've built up over the years who have shown interest in Hypercolor and, and the other labels, and I've used that to my advantage to kind of achieve the same results for some of the other labels that I'm working with. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I've sort of built up this this PR operation to, um, I mean, it's called Hype Electronic Music Filter, and it really is kind of my definition of me filtering what I consider to be cool and interesting yeah, music, yeah. you know? Yeah, the stuff um, you want to get out there. Yeah, basically. yeah. So um, yeah, and I think that's it's going particularly well, and it sort of is, I think it is built up quite a reputation for, um, you know, being a trusted source for, for Cool music. Yeah, I think so. Every time cool. I get a little bit of hype stuff through my into my inbox, I'm like, yeah, cool. It's good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And how did um, so how did Hypercolor sort of come into being? Because uh, obviously you'd met Alex prior to getting that all started, and yeah. you'd sort of become mates and stuff. And that's right. When did you kind of decide? Right, we're gonna sort of. So I mean, Alex. Alex was making music, just making music in Logic at the time, and. Um, yeah, we just kind of struck up a friendship, I guess. And uh, I was perhaps one of the few people um, that would bother to give him any sort of feedback on his music. Mm. Um, at the time, which kind of, it was good, but I mean, he's, he's come on leaps and bounds now. Yeah. Um, but it was good enough for us to, you know, think that we, we could start up our own label. Um, you know, just I think that was based on what we was listening to at the time and a lot of the music that, that was being put out. And we're talking like this is 
when the the minimal music was kind of at its peak. So yeah, the labels like, like minus. Mm. Um, and I guess like the whole get physical thing, which is kind of further, you know, as, as that progressed, kind of went into a house label. But um, yeah, I guess really just, you know, kind of based on what Alex was doing, we kind of thought that there was, you know, we could, we could compete at that level, I guess. Mm. Um, Alex was also very good friends with Chris, who was doing Glimpse at the time. Right. Who was doing the Glimpse stuff, sorry. Yeah. And he was doing particularly well, you know, and he was putting out some really interesting records. And um, they're actually records that, you know, I, I would buy and Alex would buy. So we were quite fortunate that we got the label off to a, a good start. I mean, Glimpse did the first release, mm. um, which is still a record that I really enjoy. You know, I, I, I listen back to that first release and I'm quite proud of it still. There is some records, through, you know, through the catalogue that perhaps were a bit iffy. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been seven years though, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it's been seven years, man, and uh, you know, our sound has definitely progressed um, and evolved, and I think where we're at now is a kind of amalgamation of, of everything that we've kind of grown up listening to, yeah. and what we've been into as DJs as well. Um, that's everything from those sort of hardcore tape cassettes that I spoke about earlier that I got from my dad, which I was exchanging in the playground at school, through to drum and bass, UK rave culture generally. Mm. Um, even now, kind of the hip hop's come out in some of the labels I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm involved yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, there's predominantly the theme is, is house music mm. and, um, and obviously techno as well. You know, it's kind of, yeah, pretty much sort of based around those, te those two as, as, as the key sort of mm. sounds that we're exploiting, I think. So. And so, like, the last. Yeah, like especially, well, 2012, like a massive year for you guys. Like almost every <coughs> release was like, bang, another big release, bang, another big release. Yeah. How did you kind of get to that point? And, and was the previous year kind of like a build up to that? Did you expect that last year was going to be as big as it was going to be? Um, I mean, it was, without doubt, it was, it was our biggest year to date. And it's, I mean, I'm just sort of in my head now thinking about how some of those records come about and I mean, a few of them were, were actually purely about being in the right place at the right time. Mm. I mean, like the Huxley record. <laughs> That's got a good story behind it. Yeah, it was just <laughs> like, that was Huxley, first time he played it was, at, um, was in an ice cream van at Glade Festival. He turned up late and he was really apologetic and I was really pissed off with him, actually. I was, oh, excuse <laughs> my language. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, he sort of played that and I was like, what is this? And he was like, it's mine. I was like, oh, okay. Yes, can we sign this? <laughs> and, um, and the Maxi Sound System thing, it was actually, um, I, I, I know Sam from Brighton, um, you know, having sort of lived there for, for, for the last sort of 10 years before moving to Bristol last year. And uh, he was playing for the Future Boogie guys. And uh, yeah, I just went down to sort of say hello to him. And I sort of pretty much caught the last 30 minutes of his set, but it mm. was probably the most important 30 minutes of his set because the last tune he played was that? was that Regrets We Have No Use For. And um, yeah, we kind of went back to um, the Future Boogie HQ after party and uh, just got chatting with him and he was like, oh, it's unsigned. I was like, well, yeah, we'll definitely take that. <laughs> cool. um, much to um, Mr. Harvey's dismay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, a lot of the, the artists and, and releases that we've done, um, you know, last year have really just, it's just been a matter of sort of chasing down and, and contacting artists that, whose music we were feeling, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, George Fitzgerald and Mosca in particular. Mm. I mean, Mosca was sort of somebody that we was in contact with pretty much after his Night Slugs release, um, which, I mean, anyone sort of listening to what I'm saying now is probably thinking, well, that, that was nowhere near, you know, a, a hypercolor sounding mm, release, but, it, mm. but there was uh, enough, it was just new and interesting. I really liked it. And um, yeah, kind of have just been in touch with him ever since. But I mean, it wasn't like we, we contacted him and asked him to do a house EP. It's just, mm. I guess that was a product of the way things have gone in terms of, you know, Everyone's making house music now. Yeah, yeah, and, totally, totally. Um, and perhaps him just wanting to do something on a hypercolor tip. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so, did you not give him any sort of guidelines about what you wanted him to do when you kind of tracked him down? No, so you just say, nothing at all. It yeah. was just like hit us up with 
you know, whatever, basically. And uh, Eva Mendes was the first track he sent over. I was like, mm. perfect. And then he sent us over a few dubs, um, which we were kind of discussing about getting vocals on. And the end result was Robert Owens doing the vocals on Accidentally. Nice and uh, I can now reveal was Ben Westbeach on Murderous at the time. Oh, we, right. we, yeah, we couldn't, because <laughs> he was in a deal with, I can't remember the label, I think, mm. Strictly Rhythm, but... Um, so yeah, I mean, it was just it was just a matter of him perhaps just kind of doing something that was kind of more relevant to, to what we were about. And I guess also, you know, he was on the receiving end of what we were doing via promos and stuff. And I know he was yeah. a fan of Maya and, yeah. you know, he, he plays a lot of house in his sets and stuff now. So I guess it was just a natural progression, really. Yeah, 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 for sure, man. And so, like, going from the time when you were throwing parties and stuff back in the day to sort of starting a label, mm. how long did it take you to get to grips with the business side of stuff? Because I guess that must <laughs> be something that's quite hard to get your head around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, oh God, it's a pitfall of, of um, admin work, basically. Yeah. Um, it's, still, it's still something that, you know, it's sort of difficult to get your head around. But, I mean, you kind of... I mean, eventually you, you kind of get used to the protocol of the manufacturing side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, as the years have gone, on, gone along, we've kind of stumbled across um, things like MCPS and PPR, which are the various sort of collection societies for, you know, physical products and radio plays and stuff like that. Um, so it's kind of been a matter over the last few years of Google it, and educate yourself on the matter. Mm. And, um, you know, we're quite fortunate that we have, um, you know, we've got, we're working with a label management company as well. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm, I'm quite a busy chap, basically. I, I, you know, I yeah. do, um, obviously, doing the PR stuff um, and sort of a and r in across six record labels. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're quite fortunate that we, we have a label management company that kind of take care of that stuff now. Um, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very fortunate situation for us to be, be in. But, um, you know, we have gone through that whole stages and process of, you know, having to educate ourselves on, you know, the processes of, of putting out a record and mm. dealing with distributors and digital distributors and, like I said, the various collection societies. So, um, yeah, we're kind of up to scratch with all that, but yeah, just in a very fortunate position where we don't kind of have to focus on that at the moment. Yeah, so. yeah, it must take the pressure off quite a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's it's good, man. It just, I mean, as as a label, you know, we're you know we're we're we're, we're, we're financing um, or we're putting out we're putting a lot of finance into what we're doing. Um, as you've probably seen, I mean, we're pretty much averaging sort of four physical records every six weeks at the moment. Mm. Um, it's quite a lot, man. It is quite a lot, yeah. Um, but um, I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest. I, I think, you know, we've, we've, we've got a lot of music in the mm. pipeline. We have had so for the last year or so. Um, and it's, it's quite a good situation to be in when working with artists because we're not, we're not waiting around, really. I mean, years and years ago, um, we were always at the mercy of the distributor. So when you're in control of your own finances, you're in a situation whereby you're waiting for money from your distributor mm -hmm. um, in order to pay whatever bills, remix fees, promotional costs or whatever. Um, and you kind of, yeah, you're, you're, you're working on a release to release basis, you know, sort of monitoring profit and losses that way. Um, Whereas at where at the moment the labels are sort of, you know, they're doing particularly well. So we kind of we trust in the releases enough to yeah. actually not have to wait to see how well they do mm. before just going for the next release. Um, some might say we're doing too much, but um, I think I think as long as there's a strong thread of consistency, yeah, which yeah, I believe yeah. there is. Yeah. Um, then I don't think it matters, you know. Um, and I think I think that it's kind of no surprises that our incessant release schedule over the last year has kind of got us to where we are at the, at the moment. Yeah, you know? no doubt, man. Yeah, no doubt. And what about your other labels? Because you've got your your hands in a few other labels apart yeah, from Hypercolor. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you want to sort of um, break it down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Break it down. 
So we've got obviously Hypercolor is the mothership, mm -hmm. shall we call it. Um, we, we also have a digital only arm to that label and that is kind of, was initially set up as a, as a sort of testing ground for new artists. I mean, it's quite a big risk to put out a physical record from a relatively unknown artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, I think vinyl sales differ very much from digital sales and it, it's sort of, it's a different market effectively and um, some of these sort of old vinyl heads, you know, they know what they like and they might not ever check that new release from that new artist, you know. That's it, man. Um, so with that in mind, yeah, we've used that as a testing ground, really, to, to, to put out releases from, from new artists, and we've nurtured quite a lot of talent from, from, through that. I mean, the first release we ever did with Maya Jane Coles was a digital-only release, um, and that kind of led on to, you know, sort of, okay, yeah, she, she does, you know, she sells good units, so yeah. we can go on to a physical product now. Um, um, so yeah, so we've got that, that sort of digital only side to the label. We've now got um, Hype Limited, um, which is, uh, should we call it Pro Vinyl. Um, it's, I mean, sound-wise is, I think it veers more towards a traditional take on house and techno, so kind of references perhaps Chicago and Detroit, yeah. but with some sort of modern day production sensibilities. Um, and we tend to release the digital um, on that label sort of a good couple of months afterwards. So we're actually, when we say pro vinyl, we, we're just giving the, the vinyl a, a sort of better opportunity to sell. Um, we also have Losing Suki, um, which is... An interesting label. Yeah. yeah. But it's, uh, that's named after Alex's nan's cat <laughs> that went missing. <laughs> Hence the name Losing Suki. Did she ever find she, it? No, she never found oh, the cat. No. Um, and that has kind of started to define itself as uh, sort of being very much a sort of UK sound, I think. Yeah. Uh, references sort of garage quite a lot, mm. um, even drum and bass. Um, and there's some, yeah, some really interesting releases we're doing on that. Um, in particular, I mean, that's kind of where the first Bearskin release came about. I just did a release with the Forget Me Not, a, a new trio from Bristol. Um, That's a really good release. Yeah, really, really yeah. good release. Really and uh, what else do we have? We uh, glass table as glass well. Table, uh, yeah. So glass table is um, it's a bit of a vanity project, I guess. I mean, it's um, I would say loss leader, but I mean, it's 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 not really. I mean, we manufacture five hundred records. Uh, they are picture discs. Um, I wish I had one to show you, actually. Yeah, the artwork's um, really yeah, good, man. Yeah, the artwork's amazing, um, which is all the artwork is done by Alex, who is a award-winning graphic designer, so he keeps telling me. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the glass table releases, I mean, each release individually is a picture disc. Um, there's some sort of cool um, references to iconic logos and stuff like that. Mm. Um, I won't say publicly. I mean, you can go and research them, but some interesting stuff. And uh, the sleeves as well are kind of quite, um, how could I put it, raunchy, I guess. Yeah. Um, sort of lots of <laughs> naked skin <laughs> on them. Um, but the whole vibe of that label, I mean, it literally references a table in Alex's living room where for quite a few years, uh, me and him used to kind of go back to his flat after whatever, doing a DJ gig or a party or something. and. Uh, we sort of sit around the table and um, get pretty smashed and uh, dream about taking over the world, basically. Um, <laughs> so, so it's quite a, it's got a lot of symbolism behind it then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the music that we put out is, um, I guess, quite reminiscent of what we would listen to around that table at the stupid o'clock in the morning. And uh, so it's quite slow, quite sex sexy, mm. quite druggy. Um, so yeah, those are the labels I run with Alex. Um, aside to, to that, I run uh, a label called Sneaker Social Club, uh, which has a big emphasis on sneaker art. Um, mm. I'm a sneaker obsessive, um, always have been since I've been at school. Because you got, it's the, it's the font's almost the same, it's the Nike font, isn't it? pretty much yeah. just ripped off the Nike font, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it looks e good though, it's nice and bold. That's exactly the brief I gave the designer, <laughs> was just to rip off the Make Nike Make it look logo. like Nike. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, that kind of references for me um, 
what I grew up listening to, what are those sort of take cassettes I was taking to, to school. So it kind of references um, 90s hardcore rave music. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, it's kind of brought up to date with the artists that we're working with. Um, and we got off to a really good start. I mean, that first release from Throwing Snow is still, mm. to this day, one of my favourite releases. It's a double A side, um, a really cool video that was done for it as well. Um, so each, each, um, each release has an A2 poster mm -hmm. that is individually designed by um, various sort of artists that I, I find on the internet and contact and say, look, I'm doing this project. Would you be interested in getting involved? And um, most of them are sort of open to it because it's quite interesting and yeah, different and stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a whole world of sneaker art out there. Um, like, yeah, just Google sneaker art and you'll see some really actually quite interesting and amazing stuff. And I think some of the posters we've done have been really cool. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I've got that label and also a label called Space Hardware, which is kind of in its infancy uh, into the third release on that. And... Uh, I guess that's more of a sort of headphone project, really. Mm. Um, I, I think as I'm getting older, I tend to sort of, I, I tend to buy a lot more electronic music that I perhaps wouldn't play in clubs. Yeah, yeah. Um, Burial being a prime example, mm. and there's kind of a lot of this sort of post dubstep stuff, and there's lots of like sort of electronica and experimental stuff from artists like. Um, like Vessel and Hype Williams, that um, it's really weird, but yeah. I kind of quite enjoy it, you yeah. know? And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of followed on from me exploring and finding this sort of new area that, that I quite like. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the last release from was from an artist called Deft, and uh, it's kind of on a bit of a flying lotus tip, actually, mm. I think. Mm. Um, and it has a incredible vocal from um, Onmas Keith, who is, is part of Sara Creative, that was, I think was signed to Kanye West label back in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And he's also actually just won a Grammy for producing Frank Ocean's last album. So like for me, that's quite a coup to have yeah, him yeah. Um, firstly say yes to mm. this project. And um, it's quite cheesy, quite, you know, reminds me of like early Slick Rick or LL Cool J like the vocal does, mm. but um, I think it's great, you know, he's nailed it's a, it. It's and a massive track, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it really is, good. I think so. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's very different from the previous two releases. Um, actually, no, The Deft is the second release, Placeholder was the first, so the third one I've got coming up is from Blacksmith. Right. Um, and he's actually probably a bit more on a sort of, sort of synthy, garagey tip. But again, it's really interesting and it's sort of really melodic. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just like, I don't really know if there's any sort of theme on that. I, I said it's a, a headphone project to mm. begin with, but actually that next Blacksmith release is probably something you can play in a club. So um, yeah, yeah, for I sure. guess I'm just going to yeah. follow my nose on that one and do what I want. But, um, <laughs> So yeah, there you have it, six labels, it's quite a lot. But, How do you um, keep on I top think, of it all, man? Um, I just have, I think I have uh, quite a healthy hunger for just finding new music. Mm. Um, I think I get bored quite easily as well. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm up for starting any more labels anytime <laughs> soon. Um, but yeah, I think they're all very relevant in their own right and they all sort of cover a certain part or area of electronic music. I mean, as we know, electronic music now has kind of grown into yeah. multi-genres. Yeah. Um, but it's great, it's a really exciting time for, for electronic music. The fact that Disclosure were number two in the top 40 last week. Yeah, it's week, great, isn't it? Like, it's fantastic yeah. and it's kind of, for me personally, someone who's kind of, you know, this is my life now. It's an exciting time and it's mm. an exciting prospect to kind of potentially be involved in that. And I, I don't know, I don't know where dance music is, is, is you know, is it going to get fully in the charts again? I don't know. I yeah. mean, like when we were kids. It was all over the place, was, yeah, wasn't it? You yeah, you know, like Inner City, Big Fun or Good Life was like, yeah, made it into the top 10. And, you know, all those Detroit guys made a load of money from yeah, yeah. big UK majors sort of signing their stuff at the time. But um, The thing is now, though, is you get a lot of people that, are really against it and want it to stay underground. Where, whereas, I, I, obviously, I wasn't 
there as an adult back then, but I kind of imagine that the, these guys just wanted their music to be heard by everyone and they were cool with it going into the charts and yeah. cool with having videos made. And now it's like, oh no, disclosure in the charts, they've sold out and you get all this kind I of think like, it, I think that's a load of rubbish. I, mm. think, I think also from my point of view, um, you know, considering the state of um, the sort of economic side of music in terms of piracy and file sharing and stuff mm. like that, I think any further opportunity to kind of bring what we're doing to a, to a wider audience is great. And let's not forget, you know, the charts are a awash with what I would consider to be um, horrid EDM sort of David Greta type stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, sorry if I've you know upset <laughs> anybody with that comment, but you know, the disclosure track is actually it's credible dance music. And the fact that it's gone into the charts, and also, I mean, what was it, the benediction as well, you know, a sort of a month or so prior to that, sort yeah. of just made it in at the, the top 40. Mm. You know, this is all credible dance music. This is all stuff that, you know, gets played in clubs that people go out to and dance to. So I'm all for it, you know. Um, but then I would say that if I'm <laughs> someone who's sort of, you know, kind of, putting all their, their life into music and That's trying it, to man. make something of it. So. But are you finding there's, you having sort of, is there any kind of anything filtering through from stuff like that happening in, like in terms of what's happening with Hypercolor? Are you having any interest from sort of bigger companies or, you know? Um, not, not at the moment, but I mean, who knows what the future might hold. Mm. I mean, we're, we've got some sort of potentially interesting um, prospects lined up for 2013. Um, you know, it's all stuff in the pipeline, not stuff really that I can talk about at the moment. Mm. But, um, I mean, we are an underground house label and, and we will always remain so. Um, but, I mean, we, we're sort of going to be doing a few artist albums this year. Um, cool. So, I mean, I can mention one, which is Luke Vibert. But, I mean, Wicked. he's kind of, you know, he comes from a warp sort of Planet Moo background. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, he, he for sure won't go into the top 40, but I mean, that's a really interesting opportunity for us. And um, we're going to be doing something with Solid Groove, which is Switch, nice or one. Major Lazer, or was in Major Lazer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, until he delivers sort of some tracks, I don't, you know, who knows? You know, yeah. the guy is, um, is living over in LA and is running his own production company and is producing music for the likes of Beyonce and Rihanna and Chris Brown and stuff like that. So, so you know, he's yeah. like, what is he gonna, what's he gonna could, come he, out could he kind of apply that to <laughs> house music? I don't know, man. Solid Groove for me was probably one of, you know, what, sort of five, six years ago, was one of those producers that would, was just buy on site. Like yeah, 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 um, yeah, 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 completely. Things like this is sick and yeah. uh, get on down and get your dub on and, um, so I mean that's that for us is a massive coup. I mean this is an exclusive, by the way. Not many people know Thank that. Thank you very much. There you go. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, dependent on what he sends, I don't know. It's like how did know, that come about anyway? Um, I've I've known Dave um, for, for quite quite some time. I used to uh, when I was putting on those those parties. Um, yeah, he, he kind of I used to get him to play for me a good two or three times a year. Oh, wicked! I loved him that much. Um, <laughs> And he was a great laugh as well, you know, he'd sort of turn up and get involved and obviously it was all about getting smashed and the party at the time. Mm. Um, and uh, I've kind of just been emailing him um, relentlessly for the last sort of three years. Um, I remember watching a Accelerator interview with him about four years ago mm. and he mentioned this sort of unfinished Solid Groove album. Right. And that I think always, I've heard about this as well. That always stuck in my head yeah. and uh, I was kind of like, what's he doing with it? What's he doing with it? So it, it's, um, he actually got, got, got back to me probably about two months ago um, and we had a good chat on the phone and it was really good to catch up with him and just hear what he was up to. And uh, he was like, been following Hypercolor, you know, really proud of you and, you know, let's do this basically. Cool. So. So yeah, we're, he's actually coming to London next week. I'm going to go and meet him and have a chat. And, uh, but it's agreed that we're going to do an album. We're going to do this Solid Groove album, basically. So awesome. I think Hypercolor's the best home for it yeah. at the moment. And uh, yeah, buzzing, basically. Quality. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats, man. Thank you.
And so, just now you mentioned all your different labels and some of the artwork and sort of the sort of extra kind of visual and physical things that, that come with the, the releases that you put out. Mm. And I've, I noticed obviously you guys have a, a YouTube channel and you put out a lot of videos mm. and stuff as well. Obviously, that's a, that's a really important part of running a label now. Especially, yeah. even if you are an underground house label, it seems yeah. like a lot of other people like Exploited, uh, off recordings and you know quite a few other labels out there are yeah. doing videos and doing this whole kind of repackaging stuff like making stuff actually important like to, to, to buy you know not mm. just some digital file but yeah a, a piece of vinyl with artwork and, yeah. you know all the stuff that surrounds it so I mean when did you start really sort of realizing that that was an important thing to do with your label well, I think, I think the, the aesthetic side of it has always kind of been important and we've always tried to put out nice physical products. Mm. Um, but obviously, you know, the whole video thing as well, it's, it's, it's kind of acknowledging that um, people's listening habits have massively changed from the days of, um, you know, actually having to go into a record store to it, you know, being digital and beatport and to the piracy age where people just don't, of buying the mm. files anymore, they just go to, to YouTube and either stream or you know rip the stream, yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> and then play it. <laughs> so it's just it's just actually trying to capitalise on that really. Um, you know, it's it's to have. I mean, a lot of the videos that we've been doing have, have been, you know, I would deem it to be successful if it's got twenty thousand hits on it. You yeah, know? yeah. That in theory is. 20,000 new people viewing your music. So um, it's, I guess it's all done in hope that, you know, that, that these people might obviously buy the music or um, come to one of your parties or something like that. Um, but yeah, our, our video is always quite interesting, I think, um, as a general sort of thread of, of sort of toilet humour, um, a lot of uh, piss taking. Sorry, I shouldn't swear again, but I kind of got away with it the first time. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's always been a theme throughout what we do, even the artwork. Um, Alex is a, is a complete joker, so, um, yeah, he kind of, I guess, leads the way with sort of ideas on stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, we, we tend to do it with every release now. I mean, we, we, you know, you can get a sort of a really cool, nerdy kid fresh out of, um, video college or whatever mm -hmm. who you know <laughs> loves to just kind of get involved with labels and music and stuff like that so if people think that these things cost lots of money um, yeah it's kind of you know reverts to that old saying where there's a will there's a way and it's just you know if you can if, if, if you can get something done um, and there's something in it for somebody else then it's kind of you know yeah. it's, not, it's give and take basically that's it man um, but yeah, my point being is, is you know, you can get videos done and they don't cost a great deal and mm. they still can look cool. Mm. So there's a lot of things that work like that in the music industry, isn't there? Like you can, yeah. you do someone a favour, they do it back for you, and you, you both kind of help each other up on on the way up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I with a lot of my clients that I work with on the the PR um, company, it's I'm very considerate to the fact that um, you know it's there's. I've been in that situation basically mm. where you're waiting for payments and stuff like that. So um, sometimes I might drop my price if I really, you know, if it's a label I want to really want to work with, yeah, yeah. or um, I might have to, you know, just sort of be quite chilled about waiting two or three months to get an invoice paid. But um, yeah, I, I, like I said, having been there, you kind of just have to be kind of quite open-minded to that. So I am. Yeah, I think I think our industry in particular is kind of built on relationships like that. Yeah, and 28-day invoice payments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. longer. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, an another thing I wanted to really focus on with you is um, you guys have brought through a, lo a lot of youngsters. Mm. And there seems to be a, a, a real sort of emphasis on bringing through like, young producers and giving them a chance. Like yeah, Bear, yeah. Bear Skin and all, all, the, all those guys that yeah, we were talking absolutely. about just before we started filming. Mm. Yeah, no, it's... Um, I, I think that that kind of boils down to the fact that we we do we do listen to most demos that get mm. sent, and um, you know if, if 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 we marginally hear something that we like, then we will strike up a relationship, 
mm. and we will kind of you know we all give some um, some feedback and and you know give the time and energy to sort of say what we liked or, or we didn't like. Um, and I, in the example of Bearskin, you know, he kind of his initial bunch of tracks that he'd actually sent over were pretty wild, really. Quite, mm. You know, they're quite out there. And uh, he then, I guess we've kind of gone through this process where there's been a lot of backwards and forwards. Um, and, and it's also progressed into him coming out to his first hearty at the tender age of um, 17 and <laughs> 290 something days, I don't know. But um, we, we sneaked him into the club, him and Jake. And, uh, and then he came to his first festival at Glade and um, it it's kind of resulted in him, I mean, actually Eyes was the product of, of you know, he, he wrote Eyes the week after going to Glade Festival. Oh, really? And it was quite funny just seeing him and his mate Jake, who is Jay Wiltshire, who we were also doing a release with. Yeah, yeah. Just sort of stood in the speakers, just, you know, kind of experience, experiencing, you know, techno and really good house music on, a, on an excellent sound system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I guess kind of inadvertently being sort of mentoring the pair of them um, to get them to this stage. And, uh, you know, the, the same with Last Magpie as well. Mm. You know, he's a, f a friend of uh, Steve's and uh, I think someone who... Has, has got a, you know he's got a lot of talent and mm. the first three releases we've done with him I think have been amazing and yeah I mean Maya sort of was probably one of the early examples yeah for sure yeah um, I mean she, to be fair she was well on her way anyway mm. and and had done a few releases for sort of Alex Arno's Dogmatic yeah um, but yeah I think the best music is coming from the kids at the moment and. Uh, it's kind of, I, I see certain labels kind of, they, the way I see it is they perhaps get a bit lazy in, they've got their crew of artists that they're working with, yeah. they play their parties, and they, they you know, have this, I'm, you know, we're not accepting any demos policy mm. because, you know, they're happy with the artists they're working with. But mm. from my point of view, in terms of thinking about the future of Hypercolor, um, you know, the music that Shinoda, Tom DeMac, or Alex is making now might not be cool in three or four years time you know, <laughs> I don't know um, but it always seems to be that the kind of fresh and interesting sounds do come from younger artists who are perhaps inspired by different stuff yeah 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 um, for sure man you know all, all, all artists kids whatever on their own musical journey and, and are kind mm. of you know slowly edu educating themselves sort of one bit at a time so yeah I think we just we just kind of uh, yeah, certainly look out for any sort of new and interesting music. So um, any budding producers out there, by all means, send yeah, your man. demos Send over. your stuff in. Yeah. Um, so you listen to all the demos, or you try and make yeah, sure to well, listen to well, the demos? Yeah, well, between, between the three of us, we do, yeah. Um, we kind of have this sort of, there's me, Steve and Alex. Um, I'll be honest, we probably, we don't listen to every single thing now. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, mm. there's a sort of filter in place. Um, you know, when somebody sends you an email and says, here's my latest Deep House demo, you kind of instantly know that <laughs> yeah. it's probably not going to be Delete. suitable for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, some people who can't be asked to actually tell you any information about themselves. Mm -hmm. My name is, you know, Yevgeny. Here's my demo. Probably not going to listen to that mm. as well, you know. Um, I'm not stereotyping here at all, but like it's, mm. you know, if you want a word of advice, any producers, if you're going to send a demo in, it's quite simple. Do your research on the label. Um, tell it, you know, give a bit of information about yourselves and obviously leave your contact details. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we've kind of got this crew around us who, you know, we do try and, li and listen to as much as possible. You can kind of get a feel from literally somebody writing an email to you as to whether something's going to be, be good or not. And uh, I can generally tell within the first sort of eight to 12 bars mm. as well if it's, if it's going to be something that's going to um, float my boat. Yeah, it's funny how your, your ears kind of, or your, your mind gets trained into sort of just going, yes, no, yes, yeah. no, it's being yeah. really decisive. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, I think, I think we're all particularly fussy now about the house music that we put out and I think that's probably down to the quality of releases 
mm. um, that, that we've put out. I think we've kind of set ourselves quite a high benchmark, which is obviously just, to, you know, that's great for the label. Really. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, the, 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 the releases that, that we kind of consider, they've got a lot to live up to, basically. Mm. Mm. And how are you sort of managing to maintain that high level? Because I guess there must be moments where you've got a bag of stuff and you're kind of like, is this going to be as big as the last one? Or Yeah, I mean, there's certain... There's that sort certain, of little worry. Yeah, certain tunes are kind of big on different levels, mm. I guess. You know, like um, Huxley's Let It Go, Maxi Sound Systems, Regrets. They kind of have a sort of main room appeal, um, but I think if you're into different stuff, then you know, sort of perhaps maybe a, a sort of I don't know if you heard the you and you and really release for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like really, yeah, yeah. I really super like that a lot, incredible, man. Yeah. sexy, deep house. Mm. And for me, that's as strong as those tracks, but mm. they're different. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. They kind of appeal to a, a different demographic potentially. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's just keeping up the consistency levels across these sort of small mm. areas of house music that we kind of tend to cover. Good use of R and B samples on these releases, wasn't there? Excellent use of R and B samples, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, I was getting to a point where I was getting kind of like bored of like people using R and B, and then I heard mm. that EP, and I was like, yes, somebody's done it properly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's kind of um, he doesn't overdo it, mm. and. Uh, it just, yeah, it's just sort of a few times throughout. I mean, there's like three tracks, I think, that use kind of what are quite obvious R&B samples, mm. but um, they're used with finesse, I think. Yeah, 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 bang on, bang on. So how's Alex getting on? Uh, yeah, he's great. I spoke to him um, before coming here, and I kind of said I was a little bit nervous about doing this interview, but he said, um, you know, I couldn't have done any worse than him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I thought he did all right, actually. I mean, there was he got a lot of stick on the uh, on the comments on YouTube for like yeah, pe yeah, some people of kind of just saying this guy can't produce. But mm. you know, I'd like to see what a lot of these other people who have commented are doing with their lives. Um, well, you just have to listen to his music, man. I mean, his yeah, music's spot yeah. on. Yeah, he's doing great. He's got a he's got a little side project which is smashing it at the moment. Mm. Um, I'm not going to say the name, but most people kind of who know yeah. what we're doing knows what it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's he's doing great. He's travelling around, playing the likes of Panorama Bar and Fabric. And uh, yeah, he, everything he's sending me at the moment, music-wise, um, is incredible. And it's really good to see um, your friends um, kind of hitting this point where they're actually the artists whose music you would go out and buy yeah, if you yeah. didn't know them. That's you know? it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah. That's really exciting. I'm happy for him, really happy for him. And the same goes for Tom DeMac, Shinoda. Mm. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I think if I was coming across all these records 12 years ago when I started buying music, I would definitely buy Hypercolor records. Yeah, they'd be in the <laughs> but, bag. But, I, but I, <laughs> yeah, I would obviously say that, you know. <laughs> No, but that, that's the thing, isn't it? That's the whole point of, of making a label is that you're releasing music that you would have bought yeah. before you even started the label. Absolutely. It's, it's, I think the last couple of years, this might sound crazy, um, but I guess it's kind of the way the label's evolved. And um, I don't think... I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't confident enough to play our music in clubs mm. as a DJ mm. beforehand. And um, pretty much when I DJ out now, the vast majority of my sets consist of Hypercolor and the subsidiary labels, um, which is a good feeling to, to play what you're releasing and yeah, sort of, yeah. you know, see how well it goes down. And most of it goes down very well. So. Yeah, I can imagine, man. I can imagine. And so what's going on with you DJ-wise? I guess you, you play out uh, quite regularly. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much one of those guys that, when someone asks me to play a party, I just say yes, <laughs> um, and then, then, then sort of, uh, you know, well, the fee doesn't generally concern me, obviously, because I don't, you know, I'm I'm not a job in DJ. It's not something I do mm. for a living. Mm. Um, I, I I you know I really enjoy DJ, and it's the it's it's kind of, I would say my entry point, but it's actually running parties is my entry point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's there thereabouts. Um, yeah, I just I still really enjoy DJing, and I'm still buying records, and I still enjoy playing 12-inch records. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I I play at Fabric for the Hypercolor parties, and uh, I was lucky to to sort of play at Space in Ibiza in 2010. Quality. And, uh, you know, Dimensions Festival at Croatia last yeah, yeah. year, but we've got a really exciting sort of summer schedule coming up, which is going to take in Garden Festival in Croatia. Cool. Dimensions. Um, it's looking like we're going to kind of be a mainstay in IB for this summer, um, but I can't really say much on the subject at the moment. Cool, but, um, but yeah, I think Hypercolor will definitely be over in IB for this summer. Um, <coughs> and yeah, we've kind of got a few London parties happening. Uh, there's one on March the 2nd, uh, which is taking place at Village Underground. Cool. And we have Tom Finley from Groove Armada playing. Uh, we have a special guest who I can't say who it is. <laughs> you guys love uh, your special guests. Yeah, so well, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually an artist who, it's not like we have a choice of it, it's an artist who is playing a few days before uh, someone else okay. in London, so, so, got to keep so we it can't off. announce yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last Magpie, Shinoda, Steve Roberts and myself. Uh, so yeah, that's at Village Underground. Um, yeah, and then we're doing, I mean, we're doing like parties up in Leeds and Manchester and... So it's kind of gone a bit full circle for you, going back to doing parties as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, getting paid to go and play at parties as opposed to putting on parties, um, spending all your wages on it and losing <laughs> money. Um, God, yeah. Just thinking back now, the sort of head state I was in after some of those parties was just like, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, but it seems to have paid off in the end. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. And so... Um, was there ever like a time where you were really struggling with hypercolor and thinking that maybe it was you were going to knock it on the head or that maybe you sort of had to sort of reconvene and try and think of a new sort of not game plan but you know a new way of approaching things or was it just an ongoing learning process? Um, it's I mean it's it's actually never it's never been something that we've considered knocking on the head. Mm. Um, I mean we kind of had a rough ride straight from the from the off in in. The, the, the actual the actual day our first record came out, so we was we was uh, with Intergroove um, in the UK. Who was so you had Intergroove Germany and Intergroove Distribution in the UK, mm. and the the actual day that our first record came out, Intergroove UK went into liquidation. <laughs> right, <laughs> so this is like <laughs> shit. This is you know this is us putting our first record out. We kind of put a fair bit of cash into it as well. Oh, and we manufactured a thousand records, which I think ended up just getting taken by the liquidators right. and probably burnt. I, we don't actually ever know what Jeez. happened to those records. So we then went to Intergroove, uh, Germany, um, and yeah, kind of everything was, was fine from there. But it's, it's really just developed from being an expensive hobby, mm. which is kind of what we saw it as being for the first four or five years, I guess, yeah. um, opting for, you know, a, Gen a Jens Bond remix for 500 euros as opposed to maybe buying food that month or something, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, we've, I mean, we've never, we've never thought about knocking it on the head. It's, it's, it's kind of always been a, a vehicle for me and Alex to have some serious fun, mm. you know? So we've, even in those early days, we, you know, we got the opportunity to go to play in Germany and, um, various sort of places in the UK as well. So, yeah, it's always just been something that, you know, we've always got a lot out of. Yeah. Um, not financially, mm. you know. Um, <laughs> it's always the way though, isn't it, man? There's so many people out there running labels, especially within this kind of area, and they're not making a whole lot of money, but the love's there and they're just, what you get out of it is the fun and the enjoyment of putting music that you love out there. Mm. I mean, we, we invested a lot of money into the label out of our own pockets in those early years. Mm. And uh, it, yeah, it was just kind of, it's not like, we didn't really give it a second thought. It was like, this is what we want to do. We're going to do it. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, like I said, I think it's paid off in the end. I think we've kind of, those, those early days of, um, like I said, kind of struggling for food and not being able to pay the rent and annoying girlfriends. <laughs> not not annoying as in yeah. they annoyed us, us annoying them. Annoying them yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of like I said, eventually paid off. So. so, and which labels, you know, going back to when you were 
going down to Massive in Oxford and everything and picking up mm. loads of records and stuff. Which labels really have influenced your kind of, and not your approach to Hypercolor, but have really sort of inspired you to to run a label and to make the label what it is? I mean, I guess you must have a few labels. That... Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess from a, from an aesthetic point of view, would be kind of a lot of the the warp stuff, mm. um, sort of Aphex Twin albums and um, or Tekra and Square Pusher and just actually seeing these, you know, these really amazing products, thinking, wow, I'd, I'd really like to put out something like that. But I guess on a on a on a sound sound wise, um, would really be those those early defected and subliminal records. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like. So influential, um, weren't they? Those they were. They, they were. still are, man. Yeah, they still yeah. are to this I mean, day. you know, like the Kings of Tomorrow stuff, mm. and um, even sort of the Spen and Charisma and DJ Disciple records. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's not forget Mr. Eric Murillo. Um, I don't know. I mean, all those guys were like, I don't know what's happened to them. Basically, I mean, Defected are cool. They're you know they're still doing mm. particularly well, and you know they're still putting out. You know, credible house music. Mm. Um, I don't really know what Murillo's doing, but that was quite influential for me. In, in they were kind of quite tough, yeah, tough records. Yeah, but then yeah. you've got like, um, I mean, classic music company like mm. Derek Carter and Luke Solomon's label, um, NRK, Nick Harris's label. Yeah. Um, probably one of the labels that I have the most records of actually is, yeah. is classic. strong label. And, yeah, and. Uh, he was putting out just really interesting deep house, you know, stuff from like Nick Holder, mm. um, like Jamie Anderson back in the day as well, and King Brit remix and yeah. stuff like that. You know, it's. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess yeah, they kind of, they're actually the four labels that probably I have the most records of in my collection. Sweet. And I think I think perhaps Hypercolor maybe is the modern day equivalent of that kind of house sound really I mean it mm. must be in a sense because it like I said it definitely influenced kind of what I listen to now um, I mean that mixed in with you know the rave tapes and yeah, drum yeah. and bass and and uh, techno stuff so yeah I mean I, I kind of I was into I was quite sort of yeah kind of I had quite a strict mindset on what I was buying then mm. it was purely mm. just to play at clubs and uh, I was one of those DJs that liked to please, so I would pull out those, you know, those, those big vocal house records and stuff. <laughs> you still like that now? Yeah, and no, I just used Huxley's Let It Go or Maxi Sound Systems Regrets, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, yeah, and no, I like a good vocal house record. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, oh yeah, because Huxley's got a new release coming from you. Uh, like, yeah, uh, Belly Wedge EP. Yeah. Um, Belly Wedge has kind of got a bit of a vocal in it but I mean it's kind of it's more it is a definitely a club banger I mean mm. that's kind of what he does best yeah. um, and the flip little things is kind of on a bit of a sort of ravey garagey tip mm. but um, yeah once again he's kind of yeah he's, he's kind of he's made his mark you know and I mean just based on the feedbacks and stuff um, it's all quite apparent that it's going to do particularly well so quality man and so just to finish up I just wanted to ask you you know obviously you've, you've kind of given us hints here and there that there's a lot of stuff going on this year but mm. is there anything that you can anything concrete that you can kind of just fill us in on yeah yeah i mean there's eps coming up from um like i said you and ewan um that's on the hype limited part of the label um artist in common um which is a really really cool sort of proper deep house track that is sounds like kind of pepe braddock stuff to mm. me um we have uh, an ep from axel bowman um, who is one of our favourite artists. Um, we have sort of EPs on the way from Elefino. Don't know if you're familiar with his yeah, stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. That release Quality he did on stuff. Something Sounds last yeah. year was kind of probably one of my top 10 singles. Uh, we have a double 12 from West Nord Cassette Library, which is kind of mm. spans sort of a few parts of house music or genres, should we say. Um, Album-wise, I mean, we're going to do an album with Tom DeMac, uh, Chris Wadsworth, um, Solid Groove, as I said. And uh, on Sneaker, I've got some interesting stuff coming from Neil Landstrom. Oh, yeah. Um, who 
like Viber is a bit of a legend, I think. You mm. know, I've got lots of his I was lots of his releases on uh, like Peace Frog and Planet Moon and stuff like that. Uh, uh, what else do we have? There's loads. I mean, Bearskin, new Bearskin EP come in. A um, couple of releases from Alex as well, the label head. Um, one of them features a really, really cool Maya Jane Coles remix, which, uh, which we heard earlier this week. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I can sort of disclose of at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I, I think bigger and better things basically. I think it was certainly with like the, the Vibert stuff um, and Neil Landstrom in particular, I think we're gonna jilt people's perceptions of what they might expect. Mm. Um, the Vibert album, for example, is pretty much him just pulling out the 303 and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's really, it's really accessible, believe it or not. I mean, a lot of people who know his stuff kind of know he's quite experimental. Mm, and mm. Um, anyone familiar with like the Carrier District stuff um, and really enjoyed that will thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy um, what we're going to put out from him as well. So for me, again, like he's one of my heroes. So for us to be able to put out an album of his, um, I'm pretty excited about that. Quality, man. Nice one. Well, thanks a lot for coming in. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, Much appreciated. No problem. Um, just to remind everyone, once again, we're giving away uh, three pairs of HDJ 500 Pioneer headphones. So if you want to be in with a chance of winning them, subscribe to our channel. And uh, make sure you tune in every Friday for the Friday Forum Live. We're here 4pm every Friday. Thanks a lot for tuning in.